Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to episode 46 of Forensics Talks. Want to welcome everybody here. I know there's often uh, people from all over the place. Um, this is the second time or the second week that we're going to be live streaming to three places. So it should be going to YouTube, should be going to Facebook, and it should also be going to LinkedIn. So I'm hoping that that is going to work out here. Um, if you are in the chat and you're listening or whatever, go ahead and let me know where you're from. I always like uh, like to see if people are from overseas or if you're from, uh, even if you're next door to us, uh, I'm, I'm broadcasting here from Toronto. Uh, but if you're in the US, what state are you from? And uh, yeah, tell me something about yourself. It's always good to know where uh, people listening are, are from. Uh, I want to thank the people who were on the Cloud Compare course this past week. We had a really successful class, um, probably one of my better attended classes. A lot of people uh, who attended there, which was great. Last class of the year, maybe. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, but I want to say thanks, everybody, for a great class. And uh, you still owe me assignments, so make sure you get that done for sure. Uh, also, I have been uh, letting people know about the Forensic Photography Symposium. So I'm going to bring that up here in just a sec. But this is something that um, I announced a little while back. And if you are involved in uh, digital photography, forensic photography, whether it's for crash scenes or crime scenes, you may be interested in this particular um, event, this symposium. So it's going to happen from January 17 to 20. And if you're interested in finding out more information, you just got to he head over to my uh, website. Okay, so it's just uh, www.ai2-3d.com slash FPS. And that stands for Forensic Photography Symposium. Now, um, there is also abstract. So uh, let's see, I just go on the page here. So I, we do have openings for speakers. If you are interested, all you got to do is just go to the abstracts page from the drop down and uh, fill out the online form. It's going to force you to give me a, a headshot. So, uh, but again, if you are doing crash scene photography or whatever, uh, we're, we're going to be covering a whole host of different topics from forensic professionals uh, that many of which you probably already know. Alrighty, so let's uh, get the ball rolling here and move into our guest, and that is Jared Carter. And uh, Jared is currently the principal of Origin Forensics, where he focuses heavily on accident reconstruction and biomechanical injury reconstruction. In 2002, he received a PhD in bioengineering, and prior to that, he graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from Washington State University. He's got various publications and research related to spine fractures, compression and loading, and several papers related to vehicle rollovers, which is going to be the subject or the main one of the main subjects of today. He's also a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and also the Society of Automotive Engineers, where he's been deeply involved with peer reviewing of technical articles, assisting with international congresses and running workshops and presentations. Uh, he certainly gets out there and does quite a bit of travel. It's also Jared's birthday today, so he's blessed us with his presence on his birthday, and so uh, I want to start off by saying thank you very much, and I'm going to bring him in here. How you doing, Jared? Happy birthday. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm 51 today. Can you believe yeah. that? Damn. I know, right? No, don't say it like that. Don't say it like that. that I say damn because mine is coming up and I'm one year older than you. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate the sentiment and I really appreciate you inviting me to come on here. I mean, uh, since you started this, I was like, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not qualified to join that conversation. And then you, you called me up and asked me to join and I was like, well, hell, I've arrived. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're there, man. You're there. You're, you're, and, you know, we've known each other now for, geez, it's been years now. I don't remember when I got out there and, and we were together on the training thing there. But, yep. uh, yeah, it's been some time. But, you know, I, again, I, I, uh, I think you've got some really, uh, well, you got a good team uh, there and you've done some really excellent work. So I want to start asking you right off the bat about your, well, your initial interest in, in you know, your field. And uh, you obviously did mechanical engineering and then bioengineering. So what was it about bioengineering that caught your attention? Um, well, so I, I think the backstory goes a little further back than even my undergrad degree. So uh, the guy who was my mentor is pretty well known, um, helped write one of the first books on accident reconstruction with his mentor, who's a guy by the name of Jim Collins, was his mentor. My mentor was a fellow by the name of John Haberstad. 
um, both of those guys are PhDs. So you call them doctor, you know, technically nobody mm -hmm. ever calls me doctor, but I call them doctor. So <laughs> Dr. Jim Collins and Dr. John Haberstad wrote one of the first books. I can, I've got it on the shelf back there if you want to see it, but regardless, they wrote one of the first books on accident reconstruction. And I happened to meet Dr. Haberstad, um, through the, basically my, my family, my mom and my grandmother had worked for him. My grandfather built, um, 3D scale model exhibits for him for trial. And so I'd always heard about this guy, but I never met him. And I was in high school, no freaking clue what I was going to do with my life in high school. Like most high school, high school guys, I was interested in football and the dances after the football games. And that was pretty much it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So when it came right down to it, I was like, you know, I was kind of listless in life, let's say. And I met this guy, Dr. Haverstad, and he started telling me about, you know, reconstructing car crashes and running full scale crash tests. And notably, he didn't tell me about the testifying and deposition and trial part uh, early on. Yeah. So he kind of, it was kind of the, I uh, uh, got you, got you hook in. And then, you know, you can't really get away at that point. But I was intrigued by the idea because, you know, I always tell the story that when I was a kid, my brother was the one who was the mechanical one who could put stuff together and make anything work. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was exceptional at breaking things. That was like, if I tried to put it together, it was going to break. But I always enjoyed, I always enjoyed trying to figure out why, why that break, you know, in sort of a, in sort of a rudimentary way when I was a kid, but this sort of, it appealed to me when I, when he, when Dr. Haberstar started explaining to me, this is what we do. We investigate why things break. Right. And it is sort of a, a, at a gut level, it, it spoke to me. And I was like, I think I'd really like to give that a shot and see what that's all about. Um, and here I am now I'm 51 and I've been working, I've been doing this since 1989 when I was about 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long road. Right, right. Well, when I was like, when I was sort of um, researching, like some of the papers and such, um, I noticed that like some of the early papers you did had more to do with um, the sort of the injury mechanism to you know the the spine and stuff like that. So I, I was I was expecting more on the on the rollover side, which did come. I mean, you've done you've done right. more there, but you also like what was the interested? So you're sort of you're starting from the occupant and what's happening to the occupant in a rollover or maybe in some other type of accident situations. So was there something, was it just because of the people you met at the time or was there something of interest with the, the whole biomechanical part? Well, so the, in part it was, it was the mentorship that I got was kind of, kind of opened that up to me to help me see that that's another aspect of, of crash reconstruction, because really it's just, it's a, it's a sub, it's a sub part of overall crash reconstruction. I think what really interested me from the get go, and I guess you're asking me this again because I failed to answer the question the first damn time. So the general idea is that, you know, I got interested in the overall crash and I was like, that's really cool that you can put all that stuff together. But then, you know, what a lot of people don't really think about is then the stages of the crash that are beyond the initial crash. Right. And, and, and you could look at those stages as, you know, the, what's commonly called the second crash, which is inside the vehicle when the occupants are engaging structures in the vehicle or each other. And then maybe even a third crash where you have an occupant that gets whipped out a window and they're ejected fully from the vehicle. And then they have another crash later on when they land at some point. Um, and so I got really interested in being able to understand the full breadth of the crash from what happens when the vehicles are on the approach to each other and then when the initial engagement takes place how do the forces and energies get transferred between the vehicles and then how does that then translate to the occupants inside the vehicles mm -hmm. and what do they experience and right. that whole being able to put all that puzzle together i always found really intriguing and so that's what got me excited and enthusiastic about the biomechanics side of it was because I was getting the, I was getting the outside crash bit from Dr. Haberstad because he'd been doing that for years. And so it was just like, that's it, his thing. But he was like, I don't really know about biomechanics. We work with biomechanics people, but I don't really know. So you're going to have to, if you want to do that, you're going to have to add that in on your own. And so that's when I went to graduate school at university of Washington. 
Excellent. So when we talk about, I mean, we're going to be getting into the whole rollover situation. So, I mean, they're not, luckily, uh, not all crashes are rollovers, but do you, do you have a, any idea on sort of like what percentage of, of, you know, sort of these collisions or serious crashes end up being rollovers? In a general sense, it's, you know, probably under 5%. You know, you've got a very, uh, it's rollover crashes are pretty rare crash overall. They don't happen that that often. And nowadays when you've got things like electronic stability control and um, roll stability control, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, measures that are put in place or countermeasures that are put in place to basically help the vehicle, help the driver keep the vehicle four wheels on the ground. So you don't put the shiny side down, so to speak. Right, right. Um, so for example, like I'm, I'm trying to imagine like different mechanisms that cause a vehicle to roll over. So, you know, like I'm thinking about terrain, for example, you know, somebody goes off and, you know, off a ditch or something or off a cliff and then all of a sudden you're, you're falling and rolling kind of thing. Um, but, and I, I mean, geez, I've seen it before too, where, you know, you just, the car is like rolled over in the ditch kind of thing. I think that's probably the most common one that I've seen, but what are some of the basic factors that, you know, even with these newer systems that are here that will cause a vehicle to just roll over? What's quite common? It's well, so the easiest one is what would be classified as a tripped rollover. And that is where something, as you mentioned, terrain, uh, curbing, something in the path of the vehicle, the vehicle gets sideways. So you're, you go into some steering maneuver and the vehicle gets sideways enough that it, when it's presented with that terrain, whether it's a curb or some dirt or something along those lines that you get a, you get a sudden application of force at the leading wheels and tires. And that sudden application of force overwhelms the vehicle's inherent stability. So the vehicle wants to stay four wheels down. But if you get it sliding sideways and then you start digging into the ground or you hit a curb, then the vehicle is going to, it's going to respond to that. The center of gravity is going to try to go keep going. You know, Newton's, Newton's laws are still in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, that object still wants to go. And, but it doesn't really know yet that the tires are in the dirt and have stopped. And so the CG keeps going past that point. And then at, at some point you get two wheel lift where the offside wheels and tires lift up. And then eventually you get four wheel lift where the center of gravity passes over the onside contacts and then the whole vehicle lifts up and then it starts rolling. That's when it really starts rolling. So the, the start of the roll is when you lose all ground contact. Right. Right. And um, leading up to that point is what's usually called the tripping phase when you're developing the forces or you're building the forces up that are going to eventually lead to that loss of ground contact and airborne that leads into the rollover. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I wanted to share a little video here for those that uh, are watching here and I don't know how well this is going to come through, but you sent me this and I, I thought it was really cute, <laughs> but here we have a, a bunch of people early on and I'm not sure how far back this is, but this looks like an old army Jeep. So I don't know if you have any indication of the date on this thing, but you know, uh, it, it, early it's back in the, it's back in the, it's back in the sixties. If I remember oh, 60s? correctly. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, you can put your own like little text in there for, for what they're, they're discussing, but you know, no fancy equipment or anything. They just pick the thing up and just, you know, throw it over and then kind of watch what happens here. Um, so here, I think, um, uh, like in the early days of vehicle rollover, I mean, were people mostly interested, uh, what happens to the vehicle or were they still interested? Is there any early work with what happens with the occupant? Um, I would say that they were, they're always interested, you know, when you're talking about rollovers and you're really always interested in how that affects the occupants. Um, I mean, if you go back to the early, early days of, you know, why do we have seatbelts? I mean, one of the primary reasons we have seatbelts is for mitigation of occupant ejection, right? We don't want occupants going out of the vehicle. Um, improvements in doors and door structures because we don't want the doors to come open during the crash and allow the occupants to be ejected. Um, improvement of general sort of the class of roof and roof structure and trying to understand how best to keep the occupant retained inside the vehicle and mitigate the opportunity for them to hit objects outside of the vehicle as it's rolling. So in that video that you were just showing with the Jeep, you know, with the 
with the crowd of fraternity boys at the top of the sand dune they're trying to roll the jeep down you could tell pretty easily by looking at it that you know they're focused on adding in a roll bar at the rear of the vehicle and how does that going to maintain the occupant space and help to protect the occupant um so you know those are you got to start somewhere I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, I mean, those are those are early, early generation tests where they're just trying to get a sense for how does this whole thing work? And, you know, as time marched on, there became more progressively more complex tests that are out there. Um, and, you know, we could talk about those. But right. well, so you're, I'll, you're running this train. So you tell me where you want to go. Well, I have a, I've got a ton of questions for you. And we'll just <laughs> see where we'll just see where we what where you know, what path we go down here. But um when it comes to rollovers so on well i got two things in mind but i'll ask the first one on a on a scale of one to ten if you were to compare a rollover crash to t-bone head-on collision and some different types of events that maybe are let's say are, are more typical uh how would you rate a rollover investigation reconstruction in terms of difficulty compared to other types of events i well it's going to depend to some degree on the rollover, but mm -hmm. here's what I'll say. Whenever I see, whenever I get a crash where it involves just two vehicles whacking each other or a, a vehicle hitting some object somewhere, it's kind of a relief um, because <laughs> okay. um, when you're talking about a rollover, the thing that you don't, the thing that you don't get a good grasp on until you've started really digging into how to reconstruct a rollover. And I, so I learned this at an early age because my mentor w had been reconstructing rollovers and became well known for reconstructing rollovers. And so I had to, you know, I had, to, I learned from one of the best, um, if not the best. And um, I also had to develop my own pretty clear understanding of it to be able to then communicate to my clients what was really going on in the absence of my mentor. So as you start to dig into rollovers, nobody really tells you that what you're really dealing with in a rollover, if I have two vehicles hit each other, that's one crash. I've got a singular crash that I'm worried about. Now that crash can be more or less complex and there can be some calculations analysis that are involved in there, but it's one crash. Mm -hmm. In a rollover, if you've got more than one revolution, you're you're talking multiple crashes. Yeah. Every time that vehicle is making making, as it's turning, it's going to generally be hitting the ground somewhere or hitting something on the ground or near the ground or near the roll path. I mean, I've had vehicles that have rolled and hit other cars or hit trees, hit buildings. You know, there's a, you get this, you get the, the problem that you deal with is now you've got multiple collisions that you've got to try to understand and reconstruct. And not only that, but if you're going to try to relate that to how the occupants inside the vehicle are withstanding this event or what might be injurious collisions, you have to know all of those collisions. You have to know what, how was the vehicle oriented? How was it rolled? How fast was it traveling? How fast was it rolling? You got to put all those pieces together so that you can, you know, if I'm not doing the biomechanics, I've got to try to communicate to the person that's doing the biomechanics. Here's where I see the primary ground contacts that would be in a place that could provide an insult to the occupant at this location. And then they have to take that and try to understand, okay, how does that relate to my occupant at that location and the injuries they sustain as this vehicle is rolling? And they may, you may have multiple insults. You may have an occupant that, that hits the ground or hits, is inside the vehicle as the vehicle's hitting the ground multiple times in a roll mm -hmm. sequence. Um, I had one, I had a crash where two guys in a, in a, in a Ford pickup on the side of a mountain in a blizzard got themselves into a, into a problem and they backed, they got, they got, they got to try to go uphill off of a Jeep trail. They lost their bearings, they got stuck. And so they figured the best way to try to get out would be to sort of back down the hill and try to get purchase again. Well, they backed over a rock outcropping and then rolled down the hill. Well, it's 900 feet down the side of this mountain, and it's all that big, heavy volcanic basalt rock. And trying to reconstruct that it was a real, as a real nightmare because they wanted me to know. They wanted to, they wanted me to tell them who was driving <laughs> this this truck. 
I was able to get a pretty good idea, but you know, reconstructing that thing and putting it all together I, at the end of the day, I said it probably rolled a minimum of 12 times, but beyond that, I don't really know because when a vehicle rolls 900 feet down the side of a mountain, uh, yeah, <laughs> but that gives you, that gives you a sense of like, right. You got a lot, there's a lot of activity going on more than just one crash, say in an intersection or something like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, yeah, a lot of us think of a rollover as just sort of like one event, but there's so many different things happening that you have to, I guess, yep. break it down to its its components. So uh, I want to start getting into the more specific things like on the research side and that sort of thing. But um, uh, the other question that I had was, um, like, I'll speak for myself, uh, like when in, in many areas that, you know, when you're first starting out or whatever, and I'm, so I'm kind of asking you to think back a bit, but or maybe comment on what the sort of status of this rollover investigations are today. But, um, you know, I thought, hey, it's all been done before. You know, everybody knows it. It's all been done. And then as you start exploring something, you're like, oh, wait, you know, nobody's, there's not a lot of, you know, research in this area. There's not a lot of, there's some questions here and there's some questions there. Are, are rollovers typically, or, or do you find that they're sort of an, like an unexplored area still? There's still a lot of work to be done or is it fairly well understood? I think there's still there's still plenty of work to be done. I mean, we've made some, we've made some pretty good progress. I mean, one of the papers I published early on, I think it in, I published it in 2002 um, and, or 2008, sorry. And, you know, that paper, I kind of came in and said, you know, the way we've been reconstructing rollovers for all these years is, you know, we just do this simple equation for deceleration. And then that gives us this curve. And then we, we calculate the roll rates based on time and distance and the number of rolls or revolutions over a path. And when you start actually analyzing a rollover, it's not quite as straightforward as that. And I pointed that out in that paper and that paper then led to, I think some additional papers beyond that, where some really, you know, some really competent folks, um, fellows like Jim Funk, if I can name drop, yeah. James Funk is a is is a colleague of mine. I think is really smart. Nathan Rose and the guys from Kineticorp, um, you know, we're all looking at, you know, how do we take so this 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 guy who's just like, you know, trying to blow up everything that we've known and you know take away our you know our simple analysis. I wasn't really trying to do that because really I don't know that we've gotten away from the simple analysis still to this day to some degree. But mm -hmm. regardless, I kind of I kind of threw my hat in the ring and said this is a little bit more complex than I think we've really considered before. And then some other folks came in and said, "Yeah, and here's how we can try to make it how to make it more complex." <laughs> and so but to get back to your question, I think that what I've seen is that rollovers just by their nature are so complex that I think that they're really, you can define them to within, within reason. You can, def, you can reconstruct a rollover crash within a certain, with a certain amount of like uncertainty, but you're never going to know all of the little details. You can get pretty, pretty close, but you're never going to really know all the details because quite frankly, it's like the, you know, if the butterfly farts in Beijing, there's a hurricane the next day <laughs> yeah. in, you know, off the coast of Florida kind of thing, yeah. because there's so many variables that are involved in a rollover crash um, that you could take the same vehicle. This is one of the things that was, that was understood early on in what was called the Malibu research back in the eighties. Um, you could take the same vehicle, the same configuration, same wheels and tires, same weight, all those things. And you put that same vehicle on the same dolly and you go and you run it down the track and you achieve the same speed and you turn it, you get it rolled over and you can do 10 in a row and all 10 are going to look different from one another. And that's just the, it's the nature of, it's the nature of that particular beast. Um, every rollover is different and they're all very complex. I think there's always going to be something that we can do to make them more understandable. Um, and, but I don't know that we're, I don't know that we're ever going to get to the point where like when you do a, a, a pretty, you know, let's say stock standard intersection collision, I think you can get a heck of a lot more like solidified in your understanding of that crash based on using simulations and calculations 
and especially now that we have EDR data, then I think we're we're nowhere near that in in a rollover. Um, even when we've got EDR data coming off of a vehicle, and by EDR data I mean event data recorder data to be redundant. But you know we've got EDR data coming off of a vehicle. It, usually it's only telling you how the vehicle is rolling. It's not telling you how it's translating over the ground, how it's pitching mm-hmm. and yawing. There's all kinds of other things going on there. And it certainly doesn't really tell you a hell of a lot about what the occupants are doing. So yeah, there you go. Well, I'm going to, well, you, you know, you, I, and I believe this is the right, the right paper that I brought up here from that time, but this particular paper, um, I believe this is the one that it, uh, it tests like the accuracy of what's called, I think you call it the constant, uh, deceleration model. So yep. what, what, what is that? What does that actually mean? So when you're, you know, in the traditional sense, it's sort of like a skid to stop is basically what it is. If you're familiar with skid to stop, then you know, you know what constant deceleration is. So historically, what what has been done is there's been a lot of rollover crash tests that have been conducted, Um, not excluding the Jeep that the fraternity boys rolled down the hill. But, you know, the general idea is that there's you do enough rollovers and you start to do you start to um, figure out what's the average deceleration that a vehicle experiences when it's rolling over a given distance. So historically you had uh, dolly rollovers, what is called an FMVSS 208 or a SAE J2114 dolly. And you put the vehicle on the dolly and it's kind of canted off at about 30 degrees, leaning towards the side you're gonna roll it to. You get it up to speed and then you toss it off the dolly and then you see what happens and it starts rolling. So over the years, you know, what's been done is we figure out how far the vehicle rolled and what the start speed was when it started rolling. And then you compute an average deceleration from that. Hmm. Um, And then what you do with that is you do your effectively it's a skid to stop equation. I know my vehicle started rolling here and I know it stopped rolling here and I know the distance between those points. And if I have an average acceleration or in this case, deceleration, that I expect vehicles will experience over that span or over a span like that, how fast was the vehicle going when it when it tripped and started rolling over? Um, because by default, at least generally, although sometimes I shouldn't say that because I've had vehicles that got to the end of what I thought was a rollover and then they kept going. <laughs> um, but the general idea is that you get to a you get to the point where the vehicle comes to a, a, a certain stop. So that's the skid to stop formula in 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 the basic sense. And so you got velocity equals the square root of two mu g r. Um, and mu is your deceleration, if you will, or your drag factor, depending on how you want to look at it. And then g is the uh, or mu g s. I'm sorry, I said r mu g um, s. So deceleration. Um, factor times gravity times the distance rolled and then bang, you've got a velocity at the start of the roll. Um, I think what I sh- what I tried to point out in that paper was that, well, that's a good starting point for the beginning of the roll, but the vehicle doesn't necessarily follow that curve as it's that same sort of continuous or constant deceleration curve. It doesn't really follow that as it's going through the roll sequence until it gets to point of rest. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, I mean, you can imagine all the different types of terrain you're going to be dealing with, with weather and with rock and with uh, all kinds of things. And actually, there was another paper here I wanted to bring up, and I'm curious about this one, and you participated uh, in this one too, but it has to do with the uh, the crash tests that were on dirt. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on, I don't know if you recall this one or, or, or what, but the the substrate that you're on, the surface that you're on, you know, how does that affect the, you know, sort of how far it travels or the severity of the roller rollover? I think the jury's still out on, on that to some degree. Um, I think what that paper showed was that the, the tendency is to that dirt is going to tend to slow the vehicle down a little quicker. Um, but the, the general idea is that it goes back to what I said before. I think we've got some pretty wide bounds. So when you're talking about the amount of deceleration that a vehicle will experience as it's rolling over, the the bounds that we tend to use are somewhere between 0.4 G and 0.6 G. Well, that's two tenths of a G range. Um, You know, a lot of the tests that I've done, 
have been down around in the 0.4 to 0.45 G, but I've seen others that have gone below that. And I've seen others that have gone up above 0.5 to 0.6. So, you know, it, I, my way of looking at it is that the terrain may very well make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And if you think it makes a significant difference, you should be looking at how the vehicle is interacting with the terrain. And if you think that as it's interacting with the terrain, and here's where I think you can make a logical argument. If you think that where it's acting, interacting with the terrain, it's tending to not dig in as much and decelerate as much in each individual contact, mm -hmm. then you could perceive that that deceleration is experiencing over the distance traveled is going to be on the higher end. Whereas if the vehicle tends to be more contacting and sliding or rolling past the engagement, which is something you tend to see when vehicles are rolling on asphalt or on concrete, like hard surfaces, you'll start to see things where they, the individual contacts appear to be less engaging or you're decelerating less for those individual contacts. Not always, but sometimes you'll see, and it seems, especially when a vehicle starts doing things where it's really not really rolling as much as it is also sliding at the same time. And mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, the kind of frictions that are developed between body panels on asphalt, just sliding, well, those go way down. Those are pretty low. So I'd say there's a, there's a, there's a wide range to work in. And to some degree it's engineering judgment. When I'm looking at this rollover, this particular sequence, how do I evaluate what the vehicle is doing as in, is engaging with the ground because that's really the that's really where the action is the action takes place where the vehicle hits the ground what are those individual ground contacts look like how severe are they does it look like the vehicle is is engaging aggressively in the ground and that's probably slowing it down more or is it really engaging less aggressively and tending to slide or sort of skip past the ground contacts um, and then the other thing to that you just throw into the mix just for the sake of argument is that well how does what's the slope of the ground is the vehicle trying to roll uphill is it trying to roll downhill i mean there's a whole there's a whole bunch of right, things right, that right. come into that yeah so. well and you even i think there's another paper you did on the the fact that vehicles can get airborne and then they they roll over as well right like that's another factor. <laughs> well well so you know just for the sake of clarity a rollover is really is really an it starts out airborne. That's where the rollover starts. You've lost ground contact. You're now airborne. And then the rollover continues with a sequence of airborne phases interspersed with ground contact phases where the vehicle goes up, comes down, hits, maybe is in contact as it's rolling, and then maybe it gets elevated. Um, if you look at the one paper that we published back in 2002 with that big E350 van, um, that sucker got off the ground. I mean, it was you take a you take an E three fifty van like that as much as those things weigh, and you can get its center of gravity about half of its length off the ground or more. You're that's a lot. There's a lot of action going on there to get a van <laughs> up in the air like that. That's yeah. not an easy thing to do. Yeah, um, you had mentioned about you know like the EDR, and so now I'm thinking about technology and what kinds. Uh, well, in, from two aspects. One is obviously what kind of information you can pull today from a vehicle that you couldn't before. But the other one also has to do with research. So for example, what kind of instruments can you use today, um, you know, which are helpful to understanding, you know, motion in six degrees or all, all this sort of thing. So, um, you know, how has technology helped on in both of those aspects? Oh, that's, that's kind of a, that's a pretty broad question, but let me see if I can pick it apart a little bit. So in terms of, let's start with uh, event data recorder information or black box data from a vehicle. Um, right now there's really, I would say there's not, there's not a sufficient amount of data available to really understand a role in, in great detail. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a pretty good idea. A lot of times if it's the modern, so if it's just a straight up vehicle and it doesn't really have any um, doesn't really have anything that's like roll deploying canopy or curtains or anything along those lines, you're probably not going to get anything about a rollover. 
you may get a, a collision that deploys a frontal airbags during the course of a rollover. And that tells you, you hit the ground hard enough here to generate enough longitudinal deceleration to deploy a frontal airbag because the car thinks it's in a frontal collision. There's really not much else to that. I am, you know, have been seeing over the past few years vehicles with um, roll deploying side curtain airbags or roll deploying restraint systems like uh, roll deploying seatbelt pretensioners and, and the like, where you were starting to get roll rate traces. So we're starting to get the the vehicle has a roll gyro in it somewhere in the in the restraint control module or airbag control module or however you mm -hmm. want to refer to it. And that gyro is telling you how fast the vehicle is rolling. It's giving you a roll rate. Um, that is, that's giving you some data. Uh, the problem is, is that it's not, not always telling you the whole story because sometimes it cuts out before you get to the end of the roll. So you mm -hmm. may only see a part of it. And because the systems are not designed, they're only designed to get to the point where it knows it's rolling over. Okay, it's like so the car is, is measuring this roll rate and some other factors. I'm not I'm not the I'm not the guru on the algorithms that are in the EDRs and how they decide to deploy the bags or what they're exactly calculating. The general idea is I know enough to know that the system is is looking for when do I think I'm in a rollover? And when it thinks it's in a rollover, then that's when it starts the, you know, deploying all the restraints and things of that nature. So all you need to do if you're designing that system is you just need to make sure it has enough bandwidth or enough range on what it's measuring for roll rate to deploy the bags or deploy mm -hmm. the pretensioner. Well, what you see is that a lot of times it'll get to about 300 degrees a second and then it'll clip. And so you just have data where it's just flat line. So it's measuring roll rate, but it gets to a point where it's like, yeah, that's more than we cared about. And it just clips and you've got, you've got no data above that. And so there's can be a lot of activity above 300 degrees a second. You can, mm -hmm. you can get vehicles, you know, you can get vehicles easily over 360 degrees a second. You can get vehicles up to 540 degrees a second. I've seen vehicles go up to 900 to even a thousand degrees a second, kind of depending oh. on what's going on. Um, it's, it's, it's rare to get that high, but you can get in certain circumstances. If you get it just right, it'll, it'll spool up real good. Um, where you tend to see most of them is down around the one to two to three revolutions a second is right in that sort of sweet spot for most rollovers, it seems. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like when you're talking, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Keep continue. Yeah. But when you're talking about EDR data, I mean, if you do get the roll rate, unless it's a really sort of low, low end roll where it stays under 300 degrees a second that may not do anything for you and it may not even keep measuring data um, especially if you get a roll a lot of a lot of rollovers uh, you know you lose the battery so you lose electrical power into the roll and then that then now that's that system's not measuring anymore. right 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 um so there's it's not giving you it's not designed those systems are not designed to provide data to <laughs> to guys like me who want the story told i want it right, now right. yeah, yeah. So they're just not designed for that and so you just you're there's a little bit of reading between the lines that goes on there and then trying to extrapolate beyond that using methods that are are available to you for reconstructing a rollover crash so and then for rollovers that's it that's yeah. that's the only thing right now. There's you don't have like a, a three axis gyro in there with three axis accelerometers that are measuring roll pitch yaw and lateral horizontal and, and front to back, you know, translation or acceleration for the vehicle. So you can't get all those positions over time. Right. And if you could, it would be amazing. But you so are there can't. are there systems you can are there systems that you can buy to outfit like uh, are you familiar with some where you outfit for research purposes or whatever like when you're testing a rollover or something that you like what are what are some of the common systems that you you would recommend to somebody well that's that's so we tried in 2015 i think i sent i think i sent you that paper but i tried with um some friends of mine um in 2015 paper by asa 
was the lead author, my friend Alan Ace. Jim Funk was on that as well. One of the things we did in that, I suggested to these guys, um, and Greg Stevens was on that as well, my, my friend Greg Stevens. We, I suggested these guys, I said, hey, I, was, I figured out how to use this inertial navigation system that's made by this company in England called Oxford Technologies. And you know, what's cool about this thing is it's inertial navigation. It measures, it measures acceleration in, you know, long, fore, aft, left, right, up, down. And then it also gives you three axis of, of rate. So you can do pitch rate, yaw rate, roll rate, and you can get the vehicle's position over time as it's moving through space. Uh, that, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just slap this on a vehicle and run a run a crash test and we could see all of the dynamics take place you know i mean you obviously have to get the data off but it's going to measure all of the things we care about yeah that didn't work out as well as we hoped it would <laughs> um it always sounds easier on the front end than it does on the back end i mean we got some pretty good data um but what i think if you um i could pull it up here just to make sure i've got the got the right one um, but there was a there was a paper by um, it? so this is this, it's not one that you were involved with no it's not one that i was involved with but it was um just make sure i get it right here well there's been several but there was a there was a paper that was published um make sure I can find it. It's published by the guys at Exponent. And I think they did a really, uh, they were doing a, um, a test of, they were testing um, a pickup and a passenger vehicle and they were rolling them over. And I think they did one of the most comprehensive jobs of really putting all of, doing a complete data analysis and being able to tell, here it is, I found it. So it was published in 2015, um, mm -hmm. and it was published by Larson, Larson, Croto, Bear, Zolak, Peterson, Skiera, Kerrigan, and Klauser. 2015 published in SAE, um, and they they did a really excellent job. There was a they did put a robotic steering controller on a, on a pickup. Toyota Tundra. They didn't say that in the paper, but it was mm -hmm. a Toyota Tundra, obviously, and a Toyota Camry. So they had a they had um, robotic steering controllers on them. So they were going to do steer induced rollovers, so a more naturalistic rollover, as opposed to throwing it off of a dolly or any right. of the, uh, some of the other things that you, that are out there, um, and just instrumented the snot out of this rig so that they could know you know all that it was all that it was doing as it was rolling. And if I remember correctly, they also had that same, they had that same inertial navigation system on board. And what they had figured out how to do was to use that to get all of the pre pre trip data, because that operates really well when the vehicle is maneuvering in a sort of standard vehicle way. But then they instrument it with better instrumentation that would that would give them a fulsome data set once the vehicle started actually rolling post trip. And then they were able to take all of that data and what they knew about where the vehicle started and where the vehicle ended and where the individual ground contacts were in the interim. And they were able to really, I think really well lock down. This is exactly what the vehicle was doing as it was moving through this roll path. Mm -hmm. Now that said, that is one hell of a research project to put together. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, not only the instrumentation, but, you know, a robotic steering controller, those aren't cheap. A, a vehicle, yeah, you can probably get vehicles for cheap, but still it's going to cost you a pretty, pretty penny to get that. And then the instrumentation and data acquisition that you need. And then beyond that, just the, the sheer post-processing. So you're going to have to post-process that data and it's going to be a fairly complex process and it's going to be somewhat iterative. I, I think I said that right. Iterative. iterative I kind of felt like kind of felt like I fumbled my lips there for a second. <laughs> so it's somewhat iterative, and to to basically, you've got to start adjusting instrumentation by or transducer biases, and because that all transducers are going to drift a little bit over time, and mm -hmm. so as the vehicle's rolling, tr transducer drift is going to affect how 
how the instrumentation is reading data back to you. So you account for that. And once you do all of that, they were able to really, I think, do a really excellent job of saying, started here doing this, ended here. And in between, this is pretty much what it did. Right. Um, that is not something you're just going to pull off on a weekend. And you're not yeah, just yeah. going to be able to slap a piece of instrumentation in the vehicle and say, we're good to go. Let's yeah. just go have Bobby go run it off the road and roll it over or something. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Hey, I've got a question here that I'm talking about technology here from uh, Kate Pittman. I'm going to bring it up here. But uh, Kate asks, uh, if you think that more accidents now, including rollovers, are being captured on video, this is going to lead to a better understanding of real world rollover vehicle dynamics. And uh, she says, you know, whenever she sees one of these video events, there's always some kind of surprise in there. And actually, we had just a little conversation <laughs> before about video. Uh, right. But what, what, what? I mean, are you seeing more video now with rollovers and stuff like that? And, and do you find are you finding that it's helpful? Um, you do see them occasionally, and I think that's an excellent question. And Kate should know. Um, and he hello, Kate. Good to hear from you. Um, I would say, yeah. It and. You know, I think one of the things that Kate has been able to do, which I think is pretty, pretty amazing, and some others have been able to do and we have been able to do as well, is to take take surveillance video and reconstruct a rollover crash or in some cases, portions of a rollover crash to be able to understand what's happening. And she's right. And, and I've said it before, and, and we kind of talked about, you know, how all rollover crashes, one is not the same as another, right? You could run 10 vehicles configured the same way, do run the test the same way, and they all come out different. Well, not only that, but there are some times where vehicles do crazy things in the middle of a rollover that you just would not anticipate. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, it becomes, that's where you got to earn your money as a reconstructionist, right? So you've got, you've got generally a giant basket of evidence and you've got to try to take all that evidence and try to lay it out and sequence it in a way that you can tell this history of this vehicle from the time it started to go into that that tripping phase you know the initial maneuvering leading up to a trip and then through to the trip itself and then through the rollover sequence to the point it gets to rest and if you've got you analyze that you find something that just doesn't make any sense inevitably if you go back to the evidence and you really start teasing it apart you'll find the vehicle did something that you just simply did not expect it to do right yes. and that is i always feel like i've i've conquered the universe when that happens because i i was like there's no way anybody else is going to figure this out right right because it's it, it's it's not easy um, I got another question here. This, this is from Leopold Luke. He's from Trinidad. Uh, thanks, Leopold. And he's, you know, he says if a crash occurs, you know, two months ago, can you still do the reconstruction? But I would add to that by saying, what what kinds of elements do you need, at least at a very minimum, to do a proper reconstruction? I think that's an excellent question. Um, if I've reconstructed rollover crashes that have been several years old, um, and it a lot of it depends on the amount of evidence that was collected early on by usually by law enforcement investigators, but generally anybody that takes photos at a crash scene, I want to see those photos. Um, any more body cam footage or as Kate mentioned, dash cam footage or other surveillance footage, you know, I'd like to have that collected as soon as possible. Um, those are sort of foundational, like did the police show up? Did they take photos? Did they take measurements? And can you see a good, can you see the field of evidence really well in all of their photos? And is it documented well in all of their measurements? Um, because at the end of the day, I, I tend to argue and, and I'm sure other people will say they don't, they don't agree, but I don't really care. But I tend to argue that the key evidence for a rollover, for really reconstructing a rollover well is on the ground. The vehicle evidence is not unimportant, but it tells a story as the vehicle is rolling and it keeps making contacts over and over again. The, you can imagine the ground evidence is like you just take the tape measure and just roll it out. Well, you keep going along the tape measure, you're just measuring increments as you move along. Well, that's kind of how when the vehicle is rolling, it's leaving evidence as it moves along. And that evidence is telling you what it was doing when it was at that location. 
you can tie that to the evidence on the vehicle and make sense out of what, okay, this evidence on the vehicle matches this evidence on the ground. This is what the vehicle was doing here. And then you just sequence it through, always keeping track of what evidence on the vehicle was tied to something on the ground. And then you just keep sequencing it through. And if you've got all of those, if you've got those elements from the initial investigation through your own inspections and data collection, and you've got really good site evidence or what I call residual evidence on the ground. Oh man, you can really understand a rollover really, really well. The things that I hate is when you get a, you get a, 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 a I'm not going to poop on any particular state here. I'm just going to say some states you get a crash diagram. That's like a little sketch in a box and that's it. And you, and they don't take any photos because it wasn't a serious injury or maybe it was a serious injury, but it wasn't a fatality. Mm -hmm. And so they, they just don't care. They're just not going to, they're not going to investigate it it, to any depth. And so then it's like, well, I don't know. I, I, if you get the vehicle and you look at the vehicle, you can, you can tell some things, but a lot of times evidence on the vehicle can, can be very misleading it's like evidence on the vehicle you could have evidence that looks like it's it's you've got two rolls on a vehicle and in reality what it is it's the same role it's just changing orientation and changing direction and again in a way you didn't expect right um there's another uh, question here from scott and he talks says that you know most reconstruction data seems to be automotive driven but what about off-road reconstruction or recreational vehicles and stuff like that are there any systems or any information out of these types of uh vehicles so i i haven't delved into that world very much i know some some people that have um a fellow by the name of mark warner has published an sae about um, side by side or utv collisions the folks at exponent have also published in uh, i can't remember the exact papers or the names of all the offers authors at this point but i know that there's been publications on utv rollovers now the problem with UTV rollovers, as I understand it, I've, I've done, I've done a couple, but I haven't done very many, but I know people that have, and inevitably UTV rollovers, there's a dearth of evidence to work with. Um, cause usually, usually it's, it happens off road. Nobody, the, the whole thing happens remotely. And the primary thing after the incident is over is to try to get somebody that's injured out of there and get them to the hospital because it's not close to a roadway. And then it's like, okay, well, where did all of this happen? And, you know, will the police show up and investigate that? I don't know. I mean, it's not on a road anywhere. So is it really, is it really something they care about? Um, So those I've seen, And I think if you if you ask Kate to chime in, I'm sure she would tell you because she's shown me some of the stuff that she's worked on as well on UTV rollovers. And they can be difficult uh, for a variety of reasons, primarily just because of the nature of where they take place Mm -hmm. and the sort of lack of investigation after the fact. And then there's if you talk about there's not much data on on there's not much black box data, if you will, from a rolling passenger vehicle. Uh, you're probably not getting anything at all from a UTV. Yeah, makes sense. Hey, I want to bring this up here because you've done some work on, you know, the injuries to the cervical spine and um, uh, we're getting a little bit on in time here, but it's okay. Uh, I, you know, there's, there's seven vertebrae here, you know, which make up the neck and the human, you know, spine is made for, you know, jumping, running, looking back and forth. Um, what kinds of things have you learned about, the injuries and sort of some of the mechanisms and things that happen in a rollover to the, the, you know, the, the neck bones. Yeah. So you rollovers are rare and neck injuries and just injuries generally in rollovers tend to be pretty rare. Um, but when you get a neck injury in a rollover that can be particularly catastrophic, um, and in one of the papers that I that I sent to you was a paper that we published in 2002, I think it was. Uh, no, 2003. Sorry. Um, so in 2003, uh, the lead author on that paper was Ed Moffat, and I was on a team of other folks, and we were doing this research. And one of the things that 
um, you want to try to understand in a rollover where you have a neck injury is you want to try to understand how the occupant is oriented relative to a ground contact that may be injurious. So if, um, if you get into a situation where the occupant is aligned so that their head is at or near the roof and their head and their neck and their torso are fairly well aligned with one another, and then that roof gets a contact with the vehicle upside down. So this is where it gets confusing because the, the vehicle's upside down when these types of injuries occur. So the vehicle flips upside down and then your occupant is basically diving into the ground. And the, the difference is that now they've got the vehicle's roof interposed between their head and the ground. And so they come down the roof stops on the ground and then their head stops on the roof and then their torso and their the rest of their body really but primarily their torso tries to catch up to the head mm -hmm. because the the neck isn't translating the data very well that hey the head stopped don't try to come down here and so the torso just says ah what's going on and then it slams into the neck and what you end up with is a situation where the base of the neck, so C7 vertebra at the C7 T1 interface, basically the top of your rib cage, that is being driven down or driven towards the base of your skull where your first cervical vertebra is. And the base of your skull and your head's pretty strong. You know, it's it it makes a it makes a nice stop. And so the torso tries to catch up to the head, which is now stopped. And it compresses the cervical spine or the neck between between the base of the skull and the top of the top of the thorax. Mm -hmm. And then what you get is a situation that's been pretty well described by Roger Nightingale at Duke University. Um, and you get a you get a compressive buckling type of phenomenon. And that compression and buckling leads to a variety of different loads along the length of the cervical spine that can create a variety of different types of injury mechanisms. Um, and, you know, you can, there's, we could go into the details of all the different injury mechanisms that there are out there. But when you're talking about compression, uh, one of the things that you're, you're gonna be struggling with, if you've got enough energy involved in the scenario, um, is that you're you're looking at encroaching upon the spinal canal and the spinal cord, and then you're looking at neurological damage mm. that is going to be paralyzing. If not, it's going to affect you for the rest of your life. Um, and that's where the severity comes in. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, the, the cervical spine is really good at, like you said, holding your head up and allowing you to turn your head and look around for predators and things of that nature. But it was never designed to allow you to d dive head first into the ground <laughs> from any appreciable height. Yeah. Right. And so I think the thing, what I tell people sometimes, and I, I've said this in front of juries at times is that if I grab you by your ankles and pick you up, uh, if, if you put your head on the ground, just bend over, put your head on the ground. I grab you by your ankles and pick you and your head off the ground 18 inches and then release you. I can probably break your neck from 18 inches. Mm -hmm. So think about that. It's like a, I'm dropping you from a foot and a half and I can break your neck. And I think if you read the, the literature or the studies, and I, I saw this in my own work, but if you read uh, the studies from Duke by Roger Nightingale, what you'll find is that that's about about 18 inches, about, about seven miles an hour ish, 10 feet a second, somewhere in that vicinity is when you're going to, you're going to start breaking your neck. If you get into a situation, what's called torso augmentation, where the head stops and the torso tries to catch up and then it compresses the neck between the base of the skull and the torso. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sure there's still a lot of work there. So we're getting on in time here. So I have one last question and that has to do with what you have planned for the future in terms of maybe research or, or are there any areas in particular that you want to sort of specifically hone in on in terms of uh, studying? Um, not for rollover, not right now. I'm not, I'm not looking at anything in rollover right now in terms of what I'm trying to do right now. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to grow my team. That's what I'm focused on right now. Right. Um, I'm trying to grow my team and, and have,
bring along more people that want to that want to do excellent work and work with me and and really understand some really complex crashes and try to explain them to people really well. Um, in terms of research, I think the one the, there's there's a few things that are kind of out there right now. I do have some some back burner stuff on in rollovers that I want to put out. Um, but one of the issues that I'm struggling with right now is that I'm I'm doing a lot of peer review on papers. So I'm reviewing other people's research, mm -hmm. but I'm 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 not doing my own as much. And so I need to get out of that mold, I think, right now. I I, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but I I, I tend to yeah. find myself looking at other people's cool ideas and not not doing enough of my own. Right. Well, I yeah, well, I totally understand that because uh it's it's not easy to you know spend the time to research and write and everything else if you've got a lot of other things and you've got a day job so uh yeah i totally get that um i just like to uh i i just like to share your linkedin profile but if anyone wants to contact uh jared uh you can get him through linkedin he's on there you you can also go to his uh website here it's just uh origin four and six and what i'm going to do actually is i'm just going to post that into the uh the chat window here so people have that at their disposal and yeah hey I, hi to aaron hi to james uh hi to everybody there kyle uh, you got a great team already i know there um and uh, it's good to see you guys are busy and doing some excellent work um jared i want to wish you Happy birthday. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your, your insight. Uh, and yeah, hey man, it's, it's absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here, sir. Uh, maybe we'll get to do this again. Maybe I'll interview you the next time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to start a show too. Do no. the research first. Do the no. research first. <laughs> it's, easy to, it's easy to let you do it. And then yeah, I'll, just, yeah. I'll just go along for the ride. Uh, right on. <laughs> All right. Hang back. I'm just going to make some closing comments. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah. Cheers. All right, folks. Well, that does it for this one. It's another one uh, in the bag here. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to share this here. And I just want to make sure that I remind everybody that don't forget about the uh, Forensic Photography Symposium that's going to be coming up January 17th to 20th. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty well attended and uh, very, very good learning experience for a lot of people working with a digital camera. That does it for this one. Uh, that was a really good one. Really interesting stuff there. And I want to wish everybody all the best. Have a great day. And we will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.